who's going to be joining us to talk about the Olympics. Tings, thank you so much for coming back on. Oh, no. We have another muted. muted. We have another technological gremlin. <laughs> You're muted, but you, <laughs> but you look great. Um, there are you. Can you unmute if you're muted? Yeah. Let's see. I think we still can't hear her. Oh, you know, I'd be frozen now. And oh, How's she's it? frozen. No, 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 she's on. Am I, I alive? Can hear you. Perfect. Oh, yeah, you're alive. You're, <laughs> there's a pulse. <laughs> there's a pulse. Welcome back to the freedom side, Tings. It's so good to have you on. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, Rania. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you both. Well, well the, so I'm excited. Oh, yeah, sorry, Eugene. No, no, no. I was going to say, at the risk of saying the pleasure is all ours, <laughs> but no, please. <laughs> well, so we're going. So you're in China. There's the Olympics are taking place in Beijing. All we're hearing in the U.S. right now is how Americans feel about what's happening in the Olympics in China. So I guess what's the conversation in China about the Olympics and how does it compare to what we're hearing in U.S. media? I mean, I think one of the things about the Olympics is we, in the Western media, we kind of lose the fact that the Olympics, there's some incredible things happening. I mean, for the first time, um, the Winter, Winter Olympics is being hosted in China, but it's also the first, let's say, global South country that's hosting these games because traditionally this has been hosted and dominated by global North countries in Europe, North America. So for that in itself, it's a kind of milestone and something that people are very proud of in China. And secondly, we're living in the pandemic. I mean, the wave of Omicron has really hit hard in most parts of the world. So how you hold an Olympics safely with the technology and resources available, and also, I mean, not only to sort of show the world and also build the confidence of the Chinese people, but also try to think of think about how we can deal with the Olympics, uh, I mean, deal with the pandemic and bring 25,000 uh, coaches, support staff, journalists, 2,000 athletes, spectators and try to do it in this closed loop system way that's safe, enjoyable, and also entertaining. I mean, this is something that's quite incredible. So there's a lot of pride, I guess, in that aspect of being able to pull off uh, Olympics safely. Um, at the same time, there's all these new measures that the, the Chinese government is testing, you know, how to try to make a nearly carbon neutral Olympic Games. We know that the environmental question has uh, always been a big question for these massive international events. So how do you do that? How do you uh, use renewable energy? How do you test uh, uh, deploying a whole fleet of hydrogen powered buses? Um, I mean, the games themselves are, are uh, basically estimated to use a third of the energy uh, that was used in the last Olympics. So that's a huge technological advancement as well. So there are these aspects that are just actually exciting if you want to follow it from a technological side, environmental side, and also from the fact that these games are being held by country or by uh, uh, a region of the world that would have never held Winter Olympics. And, and I think another point is that um, winter sports is still in its very nascent stage in China. It's not something that has uh, a huge um, following. So there's been a lot of interest in trying to build this aspect, uh, especially since the Olympic Games were announced in 2015 to be hosted in Beijing. So a lot of uh, government um, uh, programs to incentivize and also build infrastructure to encourage uh, interest in snowboarding or skiing. Of course, now that's the big, big topic. Um, but all, all sorts of sports that were not really known or practiced as part of a larger kind of, let's say, public health um, interest uh, and a kind of cultivation of interest in sports. So I would say those three aspects are kind of the excitement uh, that people are seeing in China. Mm -hmm. Well, as you no doubt know, as I think probably everyone knows who's paying any attention to anything, the big story in the United States has become Eileen Gu. And, well, there's multiple different stories, but, you know, there's a range of people saying she's the worst person on the planet Earth. There's yeah. another faction of people who are, you know, excited to see, you know, any young person succeed and do well. And, I, you know, it... it I, I, there's so many aspects of this question in a way, but I, I guess my real question is, can one, you just say something to how she's being received in China and how people are reacting on that side. But I think also, to me, it feels like a much bigger question. Obviously, there's a large Chinese diaspora all around the world. And to see someone who's engaging with their own culture be essentially demonized for it. I mean, I just wonder how that affects this sort of Cold War atmosphere, you know, people's friends, family, social networks and how that uh, they can interact. 
Um, I mean, one of the things I, 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 I mean, I'm a big Eileen Gu fan, I'll admit it. Um, and <laughs> I mean, I've heard many senses. I mean, the story, I'll just bring a little personal aspect because you're bringing the diaspora, Chinese diaspora question. I mean, I'm a person, I'm a Chinese person from Hong Kong, grew up in the West, went back to China. So in this sense of, you know, her story is very relatable to me. And I think for a lot of uh, people from the Chinese diaspora, um, this question of the loyalty of having to choose sides or having the loyalty always question when you're especially immigrants of color living in the global north. I mean, this is a thing that's coming out, I think, very strong uh, in a story like Eileen Gu. And I, I went back to her right before our talk to her original post when she announced in June 2019 on Instagram that she was going to compete in the Olympic Games for Team China. And of course, uh, I shouldn't have done this, but I read the comments. Mm. Um, and I, I was impressed by the fragility, you know, of the a lot of the U.S. public on this question, you know, calling her opportunist. She has no loyalty because she's stealing from the U.S. for having, you know, benefit from the education, the sports training, the leading edge coaching, whatever. You know, she's a traitor. And I was like, wow, it's so, I didn't know that the U.S., the, the, you know, the empire is so fragile in this sense. Um, but at the same time, I think back, you know, um, like when we look at actually the, the sporting culture, uh, whether it's, you know, the U.S. in the NBA, the Major League Baseball, NHL, or even, you know, Premier League uh, football in England, what dominates is actually a lot of people who are immigrants born in other countries. I mean, what is the history of that? Because mm -hmm. the global north, not only because they have the resources to develop, you know, the, you know, for any athlete, they aspire to have access to the resources and the training possible. But it's also based on this whole history of, you know, the basically of um, we have brain drain, but we also have muscle drain, you know, of actually the mm -hmm. athletes from across the global south. And I went back to look at some of the numbers and I found it surprising, you know, like NBA, 23% are, are, are born in, in countries outside of US. Major League Baseball, 29%. NHL is 72%. And English wow. Premier League, 66%. So, I mean, the, the, the sporting and athletics of the Global North have always benefiting, uh, benefited from people from the Global South and the excellence from the Global South going there. And that's never questioned mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, questions of the loyalty and, oh, we are stealing resources actually from the Global South because they were trained in the Global South. So that being said, I think that helps put into context of the fact that, you know, that is a long tradition, but it is very rare that people actually choose to go to the other side you know, choose to say, mm -hmm. oh, go go to China. And I mean, she is of Chinese descent. Her mom is from Beijing. You know, Eileen Gu speaks Mandarin way better than me with this Beijinger accent. Uh, she spent a lot of her childhood there. I mean, she's a Chinese person for all intents and purposes. She has a right to claim that as well. But that being said, um, it is the this particular question of choosing China or choosing to be, mm -hmm. you know, have some affiliation with her homeland that is just peeving people off to no ends, you know? Mm -hmm. But just to respond yeah. on the question of how she's received in China, I kind of took a detour, is that people love her. You know, I think fundamentally there's a question of like, wow, she chose us is fundamentally like touching and amazing. Mm. But at the same time, like her story is just fantastic. Like now there are people who are so interested in skiing that never, you know, have even heard of freestyle skiing before. Um, you know, she has a huge following. People call her the Sailor Moon, you know, because she's a warrior also being so brave. And like, there's all kinds of things. Like the Chinese public is just adoring her and feel very proud to call her Chinese as mm. she rightfully is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of jealousy, I think, going on in the U.S., uh, especially among the media elite. They're like, no, she's ours. Like, we made her. She was born here. Uh, and they're just totally losing it because it's not just that she's Olymp an Olympic athlete. She's also, like, this gorgeous model. She's, like, going to Stanford. She's obviously very smart. Like, she's got it all. And she chose China? Like, what? They just they can't fathom that that's even possible. So they're losing their minds, and it's an interesting freak out to see but it seems also like everything China does is portrayed negatively. Like even the commentary uh, during the sporting events turns into this weird geopolitical discussion about the Cold War and China and its bad policies and its human rights abuses and the way they acted about the person who lit the torch 
being of Uyghur descent. I mean, there were so, you saw, there was like so many headlines and so many segments. So we know how it's being perceived here. But again, it's important to ask, you know, how are people in China uh, reacting to this extremely negative coverage that we see in the U.S. and to some extent, you know, internationally, because this is being broadcast everywhere. What, what's the reaction to that, to all this anger at the Uyghur lighting the torch and at the American-born champion choosing China? I mean, I think with um, uh, with the torch lighting, I mean, uh, Yila Mujiang, who's the, the, the Uyghur cross-country skier who lit the um, um, lit the torch or co-lit the torch. I mean, it's something that's interesting. I'm, for, I think, the Chinese public, um, it's just kind of ridiculous to see that kind of news. I mean, ultimately, there's 56 ethnicities in China. Uyghur people is one of the largest of these ethnicities and also one of the actually fastest growing ones. So it is just an, a kind of a normal thing to think, okay, there's six people from Xinjiang representing the Team China that people are there to participate in the ceremony. So it's not a the question that it's so politicized and taken in this way is not something I think that people are really responding too much to or are giving really too cares about too much. Um, and also, I think everything has been turned into, into uh, kind of some political or dystopic. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's being used a lot by the journalists there, right? I mean, I was just commenting on how uh, quite incredible the whole system of doing this um, you know, closed loop system of bringing people in in a safe way, doing daily tests and making sure that all the support staff, the cooks, the drivers, um, the cleaners and the volunteers came weeks beforehand and make sure that they already had been tested. That can be turned into some sort of, I don't know, TikTok video into saying, wow, we're living in a dystopic future uh, here in China because I'm getting my, my teeny served by a guy in a hazmat suit. And you're thinking, what is going on here? You know, like the China has had zero deaths from COVID. Mainland China has had zero deaths from COVID in the last year. And you're saying that's dystopic to me. It's mm. dystopic mm. that mm -hmm. the U.S. is reaching nearly a million deaths officially yeah. from COVID. And the world is reaching six million. I mean, that's dystopic. Uh, I mean, serve me my martini in a hazmat suit. That's wonderful, you know? <laughs> so anyways, I think... <laughs> 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 that was the best line of the evening. <laughs> Serbia Martini. But that's just what I'm in the from the Chinese media, it's a kind of ridiculous, uh, or, or from Chinese public, it's a ridiculousness that I think a lot of people are also not caring too much about because it's quite far from the reality. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, the reality, I mean, it's just two di totally different worlds, which is why we appreciate your willingness to come on. I don't even know what time of day it is, like 3 a.m. Yeah, or whatever. Ting. We appreciate you soldiering forward. How did you and being do with this? us here, Ting, so we can get the actual <laughs> reality uh, of what's happening in China with the games. But as always, great to have you with us. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be back anytime. Of course.